When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that knows when you come to a fork in the road, take it. He is the captain. Fork me once, shame on me. Fork me twice, never fork me again. It's good to be seen. It's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight we are drinking Project Dank by Le Cumbre Brewing Company, garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps. This is an experimental India Pale Ale summer edition, and it's very, very hoppy and delicious. This is for the hardcore hop heads out there that like to chew through their beers. Le Cumbre says it's a project beer with a common theme, hop insanity. And this week's beer was brought to us by these crazy cats. First up, we have Taylor at Murray State University. A big shout out to Mark in Richland, Washington. Next up, we go down to Texas. We say hi to Aaron and Leander. And we also have Donovan in Granbury. And a big we like you did to Marissa in Bailey, Colorado. Let's give a cheers to my friend Elizabeth in Shreveport, Louisiana. And last but not least, a shout out to Reject and Steven up in Ottawa. Hmm. It's all Reject and the Captain show. (laughs) If you want to help us out with next week's show, guys, go to TrueCrimeGarage.com and click on the donate button. And you only have a couple more hours to get your order in to get your hoodie. So check out the store page on our website. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. In 1979, 17-year-old Holly Brennigan was killed and murdered inside her home. Now, throughout the years, Captain, there are still four very prominent theories regarding this case. And I think we should take this time now to go through some of these. Now, while some of them are very general in thought, they may lead us to some more specific theories with inside each one. I've listed these in order of what I consider to be Least probable to most probable. Okay, the first theory is a mob hit related to her father's work. Now, this one I put as least probable because I absolutely find that it to be a very ridiculous theory. I can't find reason for this to have even occurred Mm -hmm. to even be probable at all. I think the reason why this comes up is that we have a man that's doing pretty well for himself doing well for his family. So there's a thought that there's money there, money involved. And his company that he works for is based out of the New Jersey area. So I think what we have here, Captain, is just some creative minds uh, or either maybe lazy minds coming up with a theory that doesn't really seem to hold any weight. Well, not so fast because he's in concrete. 
Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. So, so leading to the idea that he's involved, and, and this is a industry, construction, hugely connected to organized crime. And so possibly what they're thinking is Holly called to see if her dad was available. So possibly somebody that was there to see her father mm-hmm. then takes her out. And then that the supposed accident with the brother mm-hmm. that could be mob related. And then where was that power washer? This guy is poison. The guy that owns the power washer is poison. So if you connect them all, mm-hmm. you could put them all under the umbrella of some kind of mob hit. It just seems to, when I specifically look at the situation with Holly, it just seems to me to be a very strange quote unquote hit to show up, hang out in the house for a while, presumably not bring a murder weapon with you Mm -hmm. and then hang out for a while after the murder, leaving the house. It's, it's, it's interesting because the thought of cleaning up the scene afterwards would go to that of somebody with experience. The problem I have with it is it seems to me that this person that the killer spent uh, an extraordinary amount of time inside the home during the committing of this murder and afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that to me doesn't seem to be very quote unquote professional as is using a weapon found inside the home. Again, maybe the perpetrator was trying to wait for the brother to come back home. Well, and then that's that's a good lead in captain to to the second theory that's often discussed. And that is that Sean Brannigan, the brother, was the killer. And the thing about this one, I put this more towards the end of not as probable. Why for so many reasons that we discussed yesterday, but a few things that we didn't talk about were this. One plain and simple, I couldn't find anything to suggest that Sean was not a good guy, that he was not a decent guy. Uh, He and Holly's mom, as we stated, had passed away from leukemia just three years prior to Holly's death. And it was one of those unfortunate things that actually brought the rest of the family closer together. Mm -hmm. Everyone said, no one ever says that he didn't love his sister. Okay. Everyone says he loved his sister. And we, we have no signs of him being violent towards anybody else. No, no. And, and furthermore, the whole, the whole motive for him being a suspect, this is all I could find was that Sean, that the police saw Sean as a guy who was kind of going nowhere in his life. Yes. He attended Lehigh university, but was more or less just kind of going through the motions. He didn't really, it didn't seem like he really cared about attending the university. Well, it seems like he was a car guy. Yes. His real passion was fixing and building cars. And he was more content working with his hands as a mechanic than going to school. The other thing here too, maybe to kind of point to how, uh, lackadaisical he was about his education. Lehigh university is literally right next to freedom high school, which is where Sean graduated from. So it's kind of like, uh, all right, well, I'm right. done with this school. I'm going to high school number two. Dad says I need to go to further my education. All right, I'll go to this one. Mm. Um, now, But he has a lot more going for him than than a lot of people in this world, and he had a passion. He had a passion for automobiles, and so maybe some people didn't see that, but I think that is, that's the first step in going somewhere you know successful. What? And while that might have been looked differently in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, What's crazy is the talk of today is to go into a trade. Mm -hmm. You know, people are being advised to go into a trade, learn a skill that most people don't have. And guess what? There's so many people with college educations these days, so many people with degrees these days that some of these tradesmen and tradeswomen are standing out from the crowd and they're able to make very good money and have very good careers. Yeah, I I have huge respect for that. So it seems like jealousy was what the police thought Sean's motive would be to kill his sister. Uh, being Holly was bright. She was a young girl. She was going to graduate soon and she was going to move on to better and bigger things in her life. She was going to attend Penn state university. Well, let's just back that for a little bit. So basically the cops are saying this individual doesn't really give a shit about higher education, but he's so jealous of his sister 
because she is smart that he's going to kill her. That just seems very... In all fairness, they don't outwardly say what right. a suspect's motives would be. This is what has been put put together and pieced together by others. Mm-hmm. Um, there was nowhere anywhere to say that there was anything weird about their relationship, that there there was no motive for him to kill his sister. That's what I'm getting at. Right. And so to, to peg it as jealousy being the motive, it's super flimsy. I mean, it, it, it holds no water for me. It holds, it, it has no legs to stand on this thought and this theory. No. And furthermore, like we said, we have multiple people that can account for his aware for his whereabouts the night that it's believed that she was killed. Right. And then we also have a situation where he could have had a deathbed confession and still, could you imagine you're burnt all over your body and they're still asking you questions Mm -hmm. about your sister. This is, this is how you're going to leave this earth. Well, and I think two things on that one, I think it does point out to how much the police might've thought of him to be a suspect. Mm Mm-hmm. Because when he arrives at the hospital, I believe they only gave him like a 20% chance of living. Mm -hmm. And so the police, and this is not an uncommon tactic. This is not an unpracticed tactic. This happens a lot. When you have somebody that you consider to be a suspect, or maybe he at least has some information that before this accident, he wasn't willing to give you. Right. And so you show up and you question the guy And he has nothing to say there. He has nothing to provide you with. He didn't kill his sister, and he doesn't know who did. All right, so the first theory is is possibly some kind of mob hit. The third theory would be possibly that Sean was the murderer. So what is theory number three? Those first two are a little more specific than these next two, but we can get into this further as we go. So the next theory would be that an unknown attacker was Holly's killer. And this theory I do think is possible, although there was no forced entry. So maybe the the murderer posed as somebody that she would open the door for, maybe Mm -hmm. a utility worker or a police officer or as a friend of her father's, as you pointed out. Right. There weren't any reports of any vehicles spotted in the area at the time of the murder. When Holly called her dad's office, she was not panicked or concerned according to his secretary. So did someone pretend to be invited there by her father? Right. You know, Hey, I'm here to see your father. Like you suggested. And Oh, he's not here. Well, I'm going to have to call him. Okay. Go ahead and call him. Right. Or I'm here to do work on something. Um, and then she would say, I I need to call my father to see if this is okay. But I think that was a ruse. On, on some level, uh, that's the only reason why the the phone call makes sense, mm-hmm. you know, and, or again, it's a guy that she is seeing on the side that nobody knows about. And she's calling the dad to kind of get his whereabouts. Mm-hmm. Is he leaving straight from work or is he coming home? I'm not very for sure. You know, I'm not sure. So now we have, uh, you know, this boy that I'm seeing little Tommy, he's over and I need to check out to make sure my dad's not going to come home and interrupt us. Mm-hmm. Well, that would that would be the next theory. But sticking to this one for a second here, the thing that I have to wonder about is, so Richard's co-workers would know, likely know, that he would be out of town that night. Mm-hmm. They may not know about Sean being gone or even know that Sean exists. We don't know. Mm-hmm. But what I'm getting at well, is... Well, you would assume that, that maybe they would know because we just had a death in the family. Mm-hmm. And normally when there's the death in the family, then people start talking, oh, it's so sad. Now now this guy has to raise his, his daughter and his son. Oh, he has two kids. Oh, that's sad. But I that makes me wonder if Richard's co-workers were investigated or at least looked at to get mm-hmm. a, uh, a time, you know, where you were at this time of day. Because... Under this situation, then you have to wonder, did somebody gain entry into the home that she let into the home for whatever reason at all? And at some point, once she realized that there was some form of a threat or Mm -hmm. if she was in some type of danger, did she, in fact, run to the kitchen and grab 
the kitchen knife. We have to keep in mind she was she was stabbed in the kitchen. She was found in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Whatever went down went down in the kitchen. And so did she in fact run and grab the knife and then the knife was used against her, was pulled from her by her then attacker. Right. The other thing, though, that makes me wonder about is what would be the motive for that? To me, there's only really two reasons to break into that home or to want to be in that home. One would be for rape or sexual assault of the victim. And there was none. And there was none found to be by the coroner or two, you know, some form of robbery, which it doesn't appear that that was what went down. And again, I think what we're going to find here is is some loose evidence to suggest that the killer may have remained in the home for a portion of time, meaning he didn't kill her and flee the scene. Why? We know that right away because of the fingerprints being wiped away, Mm -hmm. being wiped away. And so that's, But, but anybody at that time that read any murder mystery or knew anything about crimes at all might wipe down the, the weapon. Correct. I, I get that. But at the same time, Captain, what I'm getting at is if if she was were to be, if this was an unplanned murder that went down during the course of the attempt of committing another crime, mm-hmm. often, often we see a very high probability that the individual flees the scene quickly after the attack on the, on the victim. Right. The other one, uh, which is also very possible, is known attacker. Okay, and this does not necessarily mean that she knew the attacker extremely well or had been intimate with this person. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think what this goes to and where this leads to be maybe the most probable is the fact that there is no sign of forced entry into the home one. And two, when she goes back to the phone and tells her friend, hey, you know, somebody's here. I'm going to have to call you back. She doesn't seem to be threatened by this person, one. And two, she doesn't seem to not know. You know what I mean? It it seems, I think there would be different words that would be had if she did not know this person, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, just look, look, and it has nothing to do with true crime. It has nothing to do with true crime garage. But if I'm in a conversation too long with somebody that was standing at my front door, it's, it's a little strange. I find it a little odd. You're a talker though. Okay. But regardless, it it seems to me if, if somebody's there, there, there's a reason for them to be there. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why we are engaged in that conversation. And nine times out of 10, it can either go down. It should go down very quickly. Mm. So let's get into this a little bit because there are some people that have become suspects over the years. Okay. Okay. We've already gone through her brother, and I don't think there's any reason to discuss him anymore. Yes, there are questions about his death. Was it an accident? Was he murdered? It looks to be an accident. But there were some individuals that were investigated throughout the years. Well, okay, I'm just I want to bring this up about the about Sean's death Mm -hmm. is it's as simple as a faulty uh, switch on a power washer. Now, I don't know much about these investigations, but I'm assuming that technology has advanced a lot further Mm -hmm. now in investigating arsons or any type of fire that we would know for sure if that faulty uh, switch had anything to do with the fire. We know that now, but back then, I just wonder, as they're doing the investigation, they figure out there's a faulty switch on this power washer, but that might not have had anything to do with the fire. Just that information could change the whole perspective on Sean's death for me. Right. So sticking to the thought and theory of the murderer being someone that was known to Holly. Right. Was all right. Let's get into this. It's a little more specific here. Okay. There is a thought and there has been an existing rumor that Holly was supposedly into older men as well as guys her own age. Now, some believe that she was possibly seeing an older man, his name being George Wilson. So this is how this story goes. 
After Holly's murder, detectives went through her diary trying to find anything of relevance. They kept finding mention of someone listed as simply 30, the number 30, 30. So someone listed under the possible code name of 30. Some of Holly's friends told police that 30 was George Wilson, a local guy who was 30 years old at that time. This put him on the suspect list. So was George married? Okay. I, my notes here don't indicate that he was. I seem to recall seeing something that he was married, but again, in all honesty, I don't have that information here or either it wasn't provided. Right. Okay. But here's what I want to be very clear about regarding George Wilson. We don't know what the extent of any possible relationship being the relationship is completely unknown. This was a code name taken from a girl's diary. Her friends could have the code name wrong, you know, so we don't even know if in fact they could, but it's highly unlikely. I I believe, I mean, if she's saying, Hey, I'm, if she's writing about this guy multiple times in a journal, she's calling him 30. You ask multiple friends who's this 30 they say it's george i get that no i totally get what you're saying but i i want to make sure that we include that in all fairness to george wilson right okay first of all we don't know for certain that 30 meant george wilson all we have to go off of is a couple girls that were friends of her saying that could have meant george wilson or that did mean george wilson well we also don't know the details of the journal either that's what i'm saying as far as the public goes, we we don't know the details of the journal and we don't need, know the details of the relationship with this person referred to as 30. As far as we know, Captain, it could be as something as innocent as she liked this guy and he didn't return. He didn't have the same feelings. Right. You know, maybe she flirted with him on several occasions and mentioned that in her diary, but he never he never pursued a relationship with her or had no interest in it. And, or it could be the exact opposite. It could be a full on relationship between her and this person named 30. The thing that I could find though, and I don't have the full details of this information, but it seems that the alibi for Mr. Wilson was confirmed that that information was vetted and it checks out. Plus we also have to keep in mind, there does not seem to be any physical evidence tying him to the murder scene. Well, the father would have this journal. So it's like, I think if you're trying to get answers, especially this many years later, he could release some of the pa- passages in this journal mm-hmm. so we can get clearer vision of what was going on in her life at the time. Unless once he provided that to police, they have kept the journal all of these years. True. And, but if they did have a relationship, then you also have to look at anybody else. George was in a relationship with, and would this be a murder over jealousy or, Hey, you need to stop seeing my husband. Yeah. That's a possibility too. Just, I mean, hypothetically his wife comes over, knocks on the door to tell this girl, Hey, leave my husband alone. Conversation escalates. Maybe, you know, Holly's saying, I'm not going to leave him alone. Mm-hmm. And then there's uh, attack. Because, I mean, this is a this is definitely a crime of passion, I believe. 100%. We'll get back to this case right after this quick beer break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com garage today to get 10% off your first month. 
That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie. And we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today. All right. Cheers. Cheers to you, Captain. Now, staying on the thought that the possibility of the murderer being known to our victim, Holly Brannigan, we have to go into a slightly different theory, okay? Okay. This is someone still known to her, but somebody much different than George Wilson. And for this, we need to introduce a guy named David Eltringham. Okay. He was a little bit older than Holly. Everything I could find, it seems like David was the same age as her older brother, Sean, and that the two of them had actually been friends or at least friendly with one another. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've also been told that the Eltringham family was friends with the Brannigans. Or at least, again, knew each other and were friendly. Right. So Sidney Eltringham is David's father. He was a professor at Northampton College. So a professional man, but a guy with a bad reputation nonetheless, and we'll get into that. Now, according to police, Holly was sexually active three days prior to her murder. The autopsy showed this. I'm not really sure how they come up with that, um, that she was sexually active three days prior to her murder, but that's the information that I've found out there. All right. So where are you going with this? Well, under this theory in the days before her murder, Holly had told a few people that she was pregnant. Now the autopsy showed that she was not pregnant, but we have a couple of different situations here. One, she could have just been saying that, Or two, she may have had sex with somebody and thought that there was a possibility that she was pregnant or going to be pregnant. Right. And let's keep in check that she's a, she's a junior in high school. So word of this under this theory, word of this started getting around and it seems that she was sleeping with David Eltringham. Okay. Wait, wait, this is the David's the same age as her brother. Right a little bit older than her and may have been friends with her brother, Sean, at one point, they may not have been officially dating, but according to this theory, the two of them had some type of relationship together. Mm -hmm. The following is a mix of facts, police theory and testimony from the people Holly had spoken to before her murder. And I'm going to kind of take you through how this theory works out minute by minute. On the night that she was killed, Holly and her friends planned to go get pizza. That's a fact. We know that that was going to happen. At 6 p.m. Holly is on the phone with a friend between 4.30 p.m. and 5 p.m. During this call, the doorbell rings. Holly then implicates to her friend who is at the door and tells her she'll be back. She'll call back. By that, what I mean is one of the following. Either... Holly literally says the name of the person she thinks is at the door or is at the door. Right. Or says something along the lines of it's him or there's a man at the door. Right. This could either imply that it was someone she was expecting or imply that Holly knew who it was from something as simple as recognizing a car possibly outside of her home. Law enforcement has never announced publicly who she said or who she believed was at the door. However, there are statements, Captain, out there Mm -hmm. that law enforcement seems to believe 
that there was that she said something that implicated that there was a man at the door that the okay. the person at the door was male right so the initial report that we said was when she's on the phone with her friend she said someone's at the door but but we have reason to believe that there was more information given correct what you're saying correct yeah. that there was one statement that was given to the public and another statement that was given or kept by police and law enforcement right that would make sense though because if that's a very strong lead then you don't want to show your hand <laughs> right so continuing on holly hangs up the phone and goes to answer the door mm -hmm. the theory says that it's sydney at the door david's father i've straight up asked this question because i've wondered why the police seem to think it's Sydney more so than David. It seems to me almost like David would have more reason to be there than Sydney. Mm -hmm. Correct. And what I've been told is that something that Holly said to her friend or something that was later witnessed has led law enforcement to believe that it was in fact Sydney at mm -hmm. the home and not his son, David. Very interesting. Apparently under this theory, Sydney is there and he's confronting her about her being pregnant or the possibility of her being pregnant. Right, right. Because if she's pregnant, his son's life is over. Well, it's, it's at least going to change. And in, in his mind, it might be over. Right, that's what I mean. And so he's confronting her about being pregnant, and the thought is that he's trying to talk her into getting an abortion. Mm -hmm. He is worried that David is going to drop out of college because of this pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So during... Her talk with Sydney, Holly decides to call her father's office, but is told by the receptionist that her father already left for his meeting in Atlantic City. So, okay, so maybe he's like, call your father. I want to talk to your father. Right. Possibly. Okay. Well, but two things could happen under this situation. Yeah. So one, let's say the information that we saw is correct and the families did know each other. Okay. Once he's talking to Holly and he's not getting, he's not talking any sense into her, let's say from what he wants to have happen. Right. 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 Then he's like, well, okay, well maybe we should get your father here and continue this conversation with your father. Mm -hmm. So she makes the phone call or you have the other thing of maybe this guy's a little bit of an angry dude and he's a loose cannon and he's starting to show signs that he's getting angry. He's raising his voice. The conversation's not going the way he wants to. So Holly decides to call her right. father. Can we, can we dive into this guy's character a little bit more? Yes. So we, we will let, let, let me cycle okay. circle back to that. Okay. Cause he, I mean, you'd think like if it's a respectable father that they're just going to come in and maybe they just have questions. Hey, I heard there's this rumor that you're, you're pregnant. Is that true? Is there anything we can do to help? You know what I mean? Like when you think of a, a normal caring father, what they possibly would do. Right. 100%. And that may be why Holly let him inside to the home mm -hmm. to have that conversation. And as I mentioned, this guy is a professor at a college, so he's a professional man. And even though we're going to see that he does have a reputation, the thing is, for to be a professor, regardless of your reputation, regardless of who you actually are, mm -hmm. to be a professor, professor, excuse me, you have to at least be able to carry yourself in a certain way for a certain number of hours each day, day after day after day, right? It's not that many, though. Okay. I'm just going to bring this point up because it would be a lot easier for you to be an alcoholic professor than it would be for you to be an alcoholic third grade teacher because you know a third grade teacher is going to get there in the morning and they're there from let's say eight to three or whatever mm -hmm. where a professor is going to have constantly has a lot of different hours and then the hours that they're not teaching they're in their office but it's a lot less hours than most teaching professions does that I'm no i get it. what you're saying i'm saying this is a guy that's been able to hold a professional job um, where he would be scrutinized by supervisors and, and other people, uh, his peers throughout the years. Well, I'm just basing this off of, I had a professor that was a cokehead and it took, I don't know, over 10 years, over 15 years for them to 
find reason to fire him. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all I'm saying. At some point during this conversation between Holly and Sydney, it gets increasingly heated. This was a man with a short fuse. There's, there's a door that leads outside in the kitchen. Mm. And it's theorized that that's where Holly either tells this person to leave, who then picks up a kitchen knife, or she is attempting to leave through this door. And he picks up a kitchen knife and right. stabs her um, out of rage. And as we know, it was truly a, bu- a brutal attack with the edge of the knife snapping off in Holly's back. She stabbed 15 to 18 times. They're deep, fatal cuts. And she has a few other injuries that are considered to be defensive wounds. Or, mind you this, if she's attacked attacked 100% from behind and falls hard to the ground, to the floor, Mm -hmm. those what might be thought of as defensive wounds could be her falling to the floor. At this point... Holly would be dead. And Sydney is a family friend, let's say. He knows their mom has passed away. And from the phone call, he may know that the father is in another city, mm-hmm. that he's already out of town. So this may lead him to believe or have reason to believe that he has ample time to clean up the scene, to wipe off his fingerprints and to pick up any evidence that he may have left at this scene, and he does so. Well, and if somebody comes in on him, he could just be like, I found her. Mm-hmm. I stopped by for whatever reason. I found her. You know I mean, if you're a family friend. Right, but you're, you're still going to have a lot of questions to answer if you're there alone with a murdered girl. No, I understand that. I'm just saying that that would be a plausible explanation. Somebody has to find her. Let's go through this because this part is pretty interesting here. So the same friend, same friend that had uh, was on the phone before tries to call back and is receiving the busy signal, okay? Mm-hmm. The house phone stays off the hook until Holly is discovered the next day. So anybody calling during that time is going to get a busy signal. I actually think that there there's some people that theorize that the phone remained off the hook the entire time that remember she was on the phone in her, her bedroom. And then she ends up picking up the kitchen phone to say, Hey, I'm going to have to call you back. And for some reason she failed to ever return to her bedroom and hang up that phone. There's nothing released publicly from law enforcement to suggest that the, that her bedroom phone remained off the hook. The reason why you're getting the busy signal is because we do know from the crime scene report that the kitchen phone was off of the hook. Right. There's a chance that she was attacked and killed in the kitchen. And then the killer decided for whatever reason, maybe to have her body go undetected for a further amount of time. I'll just take the phone off the hook. People, people might call and think, Oh, well she's home or somebody's home. Everything must be fine because somebody's talking on the phone. Right. Or, or just didn't think about it and, and took off. So then remember, we have the friend that shows up. Her friend Sally goes to pick her up to go out for pizza around six, maybe as late as 630, but they believe it to be about six o'clock. She goes, no one answers the door. So she decides to go around to the back of the house and try the kitchen door, but gets a quote, weird feeling end quote, and leaves without going up the stairs or going and knocking on the back door. Mm -hmm. So while publicly, the publicly known statement of Sally having a magical weird feeling has been told that kept her away from the house. There's a chance that that is not true, that there was no magical weird feeling. There's a chance under this theory. And what this theory believes is that she saw something, something that made her want to leave the house. Mm -hmm. Now, some say that she could have seen a car in front of the house, And some people say that maybe once she went to the back of the house, that she saw a person moving inside of the home. So the car under this theory would have to belong to the Eltringhams. So she could have thought one of two things. Either the car was there because David, who has some kind of relationship with Holly, Mm -hmm. is inside and she doesn't want to disrupt anything, you know, her her friends in there with her guy, right? right? 
or a little oinky boinky or know. she sees the Eltringham car in the front of the house goes around to the back and the person that she sees through the window is not David. Mm-hmm. She may not even recognize this person. She may just say it was an older man. Right. So basically the police have two witnesses, an eyewitness, possible eyewitness and an ear witness. And the thought of this theory is that those two between those two, at least one of them or both of them can put Sydney there that day around the time that Holly was killed. So there's possibly some evidence that puts Sydney at the crime scene, but is there anything other than that would that would make us believe he's even capable of a crime like this? I mean, to, he is a college professor. To be perfectly honest with you, there's no strong indicators that would say this guy is likely to commit murder or to have been involved in Holly's murder other than just that kind of mix mash of what I just gave you of facts and theory, police theory that does include some testimony uh, regarding Sydney in that whole theory. Now, earlier you asked about his background while I couldn't find anything 100% definitive as far as his police records go. I could find stories to indicate that he was, had some run-ins with the law, let's say. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, one of these st- stories refers to multiple times that the police were called to their home over the years. And it's believed that these were for calls of domestic disturbance. Now, what the specifics of that would be is not known. Okay. Yeah, this is also before the days of police showing up to houses. And if there is any sign of injury that they take somebody away, right? This is back in the day where if somebody's not going to press charges, they're not going to do anything. Correct. Now we do have one instance of Sydney who was arrested for assaulting a police officer by running into him with his car. And the way that this story works is this, the police showed up to the Eltringham home. And when he arrived there, the police officer arrived there, he parked his car behind Sydney's car in the driveway. He goes out and he's trying to confront Sydney, who does not want to speak to the officer. Sydney tells the officer repeatedly to move his vehicle so he can leave the property in his vehicle. Mm-hmm. The officer refuses to do so because he wants to speak with him. Right. Sydney gets in his car and decides to go through his yard to get out of, you know, out onto the street and drive off. When this happens is when he runs into the officer with his car. I'm assuming here, captain, that it's one of those situations where as soon as the officer realizes what Sydney's doing, he thought I could jump in front of the vehicle mm-hmm. and, and this is a sane man. This is a college professor. This is someone that would stop their vehicle and, Apparently, no, that's, right. that's not who this guy was, at least in that moment, right. according to this story. He said, oh, smart move, copper. You're going to beat my car? Yeah. Really? The, the, uh, here's a very weird story. Mm-hmm. And this is that Sydney attended the American Detective School in Bethlehem to get a private investigator's license. Apparently, he was working to solve Holly's murder and going around town questioning people, trying to collect information. Mm. So very weird stuff. It's not that weird. I mean, um, let's just just for a second assume he's innocent. and He's never been convicted of this murder. You know, so we we got to err on that. We should assume that he's right. You're, You're right. I'm sorry. But if you're in a small town, this girl that you know, family friend, let's just assume that's correct. But a lot of people are pointing the finger at you and a lot of the suspicion is being pointed at you. The best way to, if you're an innocent person, to get that suspicion off of you is to solve that case. Right. Maybe he thought he was smart enough to do so. And I want to be 100% clear when Mm -hmm. we, you know, when people think about this Sydney individual, does he look like a good suspect? Yes. If you can believe in that theory, first of all, Mm -hmm. second of all, What makes him a good suspect is that it is hearsay. It is 100% hearsay. Right. These two witnesses, the girl on the phone and the girl that showed up at Holly's house, saw something or were told something 
that indicate that Sydney was the man at the home around the time of her murder. Right. And what I mean by hearsay, it's things that police within the last handful of years. So not, not guys that worked the crime the day that it happened, not guys that worked the murder case and investigation within months of the murder. These are a lot of cold case detectives. These are a lot of individuals that were able to review the case file. They have told individuals that they believe Sydney is the guy or that it's tied to Sydney in some fashion. Now, we do know this, though. Sydney Eltringham was brought in front of a grand jury several times over the years and as recently as 2010. And it seems that they, law enforcement, have people to place him there, but very little physical evidence and thus were unable to bring him to an actual trial. Sydney was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and it spread rapidly. He knew he was dying. The lead investigator at the time, Tom Galloway, went to visit Sydney at the hospital many times, but Sydney and his wife refused to let him in on all occasions. Sydney died on February 12th, 2016. His son, David Eltringham, does not want to talk about Holly's murder case. And some, to this day, say that it's just a well-kept family secret. Now, Captain, I tell you what. Chicken butt. The cases we cover here always remind me of one very important thing, and that is to enjoy life and enjoy it with the family and friends that you have and love. This story, this case, especially points out that we should always appreciate the time spent with loved ones because you never know when they will be gone. Researching this case several times, I found my mind slipping away and trying to put myself in the shoes of Richard Brannigan, a man who had to go out on the road often, leaving his family at home for sometimes several days at a time, but working very hard to provide for his family. And then in the period of just three years, they are all gone between 1976 and 1979. Richard lost his wife from illness, his daughter from murder and his son in a tragic accident. So from a family of four to just one solo voice, one voice looking for justice. Richard Brannigan remarried and shared in the lives of his new wife's children and grandchildren. Richard lived in the house where his daughter was killed until he was well into his 90s and then relocated to an assisted living facility. As of this day, Captain, it is very sad that her father is dead and there is no one left in her family to push this investigation further. All right, thanks for listening. Make sure you tell your friends. Make sure you tell your mother. If you want to find the full archive of True Crime Garage plus exclusive bonus episodes of True Crime Garage off the record, only on Stitcher Premium, for a free month of listening, go to stitcherpremium.com slash Garage and use promo code garage. And if you just download the Stitcher app, which is free, you get all of the old episodes. And if you'd like to check out what Off the Record is all about, go to our YouTube page. We have tons of clips of the different shows of Off the Record. And on this week's episode, we covered the updates of the Molly Tippett's case. So you want to check that out. Thank you, Captain. Everybody out there, have a good holiday. You too as well, Captain. And be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can live out your MasterChef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.